So hello and welcome everyone to this webinar on Beethoven in Beijing. Um, I'm Emily Baum and this webinar has been brought to you by the Long US China Institute at UC Irvine. Um, now before we get into the conversation and the Q&A, I wanted to just play a quick one minute trailer of the documentary just to refresh everyone's memories and get us back into the spirit of the documentary. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. Mr. Armandy, how are you, Mr. President? I'm just sitting here talking to Dr. Kissinger, and uh, I thought you'd be interested to know that they're going to invite the Philadelphia Symphony to come to China. Right. Um, well, Beethoven in Beijing is a really wonderful documentary about the significance of music and bringing people together. If you haven't yet had a chance to watch the film, um, you can still do so for free through January 26th, that this Wednesday, um, and we'll drop the link to where you can view the film in the chat right now. Um, so the webinar today is going to last for about an hour. Um, if you can't stay until the end, it will be recorded. We'll send a link out to the recording to all registered participants in the next day or so. Um, and if you have a question at any point during this webinar, please feel free to ask your question using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So 50 years ago this February, President Richard Nixon arrived in Beijing where he would meet with Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai and chairman of the Chinese Communist Party Mao Zedong. Now Nixon's visit was a really watershed moment in the history of US-China relations. Ever since the Chinese Communist Party had risen to power in 1949, diplomatic relations between the two countries had more or less come to a complete standstill. In the wake of Nixon's trip, however, the hope that Americans would once again be able to visit China um, slowly began to become a reality. In 1973, the Philadelphia Orchestra made a historic tour to China, becoming the first American orchestra to visit the country. Um, the new documentary, Beethoven in Beijing, documents this groundbreaking event. And today we are very lucky to be joined by the director of the film, Jennifer Lin, and two of its consultants, Jin Dong Tsai and Sheila Melvin. And I'll just give a brief introduction to our panelists before we uh, get into the discussion. So Jennifer Lin is an award-winning journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker. Um, she created the feature-length documentary Beethoven in Beijing, which was nationally broadcast on PBS's Great Performances. For 31 years, um, Jennifer worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer as a reporter, including posts as a foreign correspondent in China, a financial correspondent on Wall Street, and a national correspondent in Washington, D.C. Jin Dong Tsai is director of the US China Music Institute, a professor of music and arts at Bard College, uh, and an associate conductor of the orchestra now. Over his 30 year career in the United States, Jin Dong has established himself as an active and dynamic conductor, a scholar of Western classical music in China, and a leading advocate of music from across Asia. He's the co-author together with Sheila Melvin of the book Beethoven in China, and he was a consultant and a producer of the documentary. Sheila Melvin writes about culture in China. She was a longtime regular contributor to the International Herald Tribune and Tsai Xin, and her articles have appeared in numerous other venues, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. She's the author of several books, including Rhapsody in Red, How Western Classical Music Became Chinese, and The Little Red Book of Chinese Business, and she is also featured in the film. So you might recognize her and Jin Zhang. Um, so let's get into this conversation and maybe Jennifer, we can, we can just start with you as the director of the film. 
So I'm interested in the genesis of, of this documentary. I mean, what inspired you to make a film about the Philadelphia Orchestra in Beijing? Uh, and how did you actually end up working with Jin Dong and Sheila? Sure. Well, Emily, first of all, thank you for organizing this event. Thank you to the Long Institute and Happy New Year to you. <laughs> um, so I uh, previously worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer in the 1990s. I was a correspondent in Beijing, but I can really trace the genesis of this project to an assignment in 2008. So the newspaper asked me to go to China uh, to cover the Philadelphia Orchestra's trip they were touring China. It was part of the 35th anniversary of this historic tour in 1973. The music critics couldn't make the trip, so they asked me to go because I knew my way around China. And when I covered the concert, it was held in the very same concert hall as the 1973 tour, and they performed the same uh, program of music. And I was really struck um, as I was interviewing people going to the concert and leaving the concert then, Chinese individuals, at the degree of nostalgia uh, that people seem to have for this orchestra. And the 1973 trip really, um, really resonated with the Chinese people. Um, and I, I learned by talking to people how, you know, the, the Philadelphia Orchestra was really a household name in China because again of this groundbreaking tour in 1973. So I wrote my story for the paper, but I always held in the back of my mind that this is really a story that should be seen and heard, not just read about. And so in 2005 years ago, like 2016, I, I left the newspaper and I uh, started some other projects and I wanted to do a documentary about the Philadelphia Orchestra's legacy in China. So I pitched the idea to the orchestra and uh, they introduced me to another filmmaker in Philadelphia by the name of Sam Katz, who has a company called History Making Productions. And Sam agreed to work with me to make a documentary. And I think one of the reasons is, I, I really felt like this was a chapter in US-China history that was being lost, that was fading a bit. And you know, a lot of people know about ping pong diplomacy. So that was the, the um, uh, trip of the US table tennis team to, to China in 1971, which really opened the door for the Nixon trip in 1972. But I would argue that music diplomacy, which is you know, a phrase coined by Jin Dong and Sheila, that music diplomacy really has had a more lasting legacy than ping pong diplomacy, but not many people know about it. So that was part of the motivation uh, for wanting to do this documentary. And there was a, also kind of a personal reason too. I have a cousin who's slightly older than me and she grew up in Shanghai. She attended the conservatory in Shanghai during the Cultural Revolution. And, and of course her training was disrupted by the Cultural Revolution. But in 1973, she got a ticket to go hear the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I remember her telling me that it was like being in a desert and getting a drink of water. It was just so wonderful to be able to hear that music. And I think that's one reason why this tour in particular had such an impact. And so, you know, Sam and I started um, uh, making the film in 2016. And if you're going to do anything about classical music in China, you have to talk to Sheila and Jin Dong because they literally wrote the book <laughs> on the evolution of classical music, uh, Rhapsody in Red. So Jin Dong joined the team as a producer and Sheila was, was uh, an advisor, a story consultant. And, uh, you know, it took us five years to make, but, you know, <laughs> we finally did it. So that's really the genesis uh, of the project. Yeah, and you know your point about how people know about ping pong diplomacy, but not mm -hmm. musical di diplomacy, it really resonates with me as a historian. I talk about ping pong diplomacy all the time, but I really wasn't aware of this 1973 mm -hmm. trip, which you document so beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking about the, the program uh, of music, um, Sheila, you know, you've written several books on the history of classical music in China. And something that I personally was wondering as I was watching the documentary was you know why Beethoven specifically? What accounted for this Chinese interest in Beethoven and this Beethoven fever? Um, you know why not 
a Mozart fever or a Rachmaninoff fever? What was it about Beethoven that really um, attracted the interest of, of Chinese audiences at this time? Well, really, the, the answer is it's Beethoven's life story. I mean, now, so Beethoven was sort of introduced to China on two separate tracks. One was his as a person and one was his music. And the music came in first through foreigners who were, you know, the, the colonists, if you want to use that word, the, the foreigners who were settling in Shanghai and, and Xiamen and Tianjin, places like that. And they created their own bands and orchestras that played Beethoven early on, 1880s, 1890s. But Chinese people couldn't attend these events. So they wouldn't have heard the music much. But around 1900, China's kind of falling apart at the seams. You know, there's it's being cut up like a ripe melon. As I said, there's the Boxer Rebellion. There's all these terrible things going on. And Chinese intellectuals are seeking a new path forward. And many of them, as you know, went to Japan to find out how Japan was sort of facing up to the Western onslaught and still managing to stay strong, preserve its own culture, but also modernize. And so these intellectuals in Japan discovered Beethoven there, and particularly a guy called Li Shutong, who started out life as an artist and, a, and an actor and ended as a Buddhist monk, but in between became interested in music. And he wrote the first article on Beethoven in China, which was published in Chinese in 1906. And he drew a sketch of this wild haired composer. And he wrote a very short article and he called it the Sage of Music. And just the very title can see they were looking for new sages beyond Confucius. You know, the Confucian exams were abolished in 1905. They needed something new and Beethoven's life story provided it because he was somebody who came, overcame so many hardship he went deaf. He didn't have any children, which in the Confucian perspective was a terrible hardship, you know, and he, but he just kept fighting. You know, he said, I will never let fate seize me. I will always seize it back. And that's basically what China wanted to do. So they put the example forth of Beethoven as something that Chinese people should follow. Very interesting history. Um, I mean, you talked about Chinese people not having had the opportunity to, to hear a lot of classical music in, in, in this period. And of course, during the Cultural Revolution, this was something that they most certainly would not have been able to hear. Uh, but Jin Dong, you, you talk in the documentary about having this opportunity to secretly listen to, to Beethoven's music in a friend's house. So could you maybe tell us more about this experience? I mean, how did you feel hearing this music for the first time, how did it inspire you to really pursue this path of devoting your life and your career to music and to using music to, to further cross-cultural relations between the United States and China? Yes, and I was a teenager, you know, and uh, when the Cultural Revolution started, and I was, a, I remember I was a, a third grade in the elementary school, and uh, so it's a chaos everywhere, but for as as a as a three a third grader, you know, you to see you don't have to go to school, but that's pretty fun. And I remember that I just go to school. Only thing I go to school is basically the older classmate to to see which window is not broken, we could broken the window. And but and because of that, you know, my my father just say, don't get in trouble. And then actually he know I like music. He bought me a a used violin. So from there, I could hook up a violin. Uh, although back then you cannot play any Western classical music like Mozart, Beethoven, but you could play exercises and you can play revolutionary songs. I joined the Xuan Chuan Dui, means it's a propaganda troupe, right? I breathe, so, so play the, the model opera or, or, or something. So I, and my friend always know I, I'm into music. So the one day he just uh, came to me, said, Jin Dong, you Let's come to my home and I'll show you something. So we went to his home. He's the best, he's, he's really a, uh, my best friend and uh, went to this uh, courtyard and in the room, we have to lower the curtain to say, and then he said, you know, look, I have this uh, gramophone machine and the, the machine, you have to winding the, the thing to make it uh, play. And with a 78 turntable, that kind of a, uh, what do you call it, the black, uh, sticks disc so then there's a big uh, thick book the so they have uh, all those records in it and and in the in the front cover it said beethoven you know it's uh, you, even you don't read english you still see beethoven there so that's trans transformed me it just was so exciting and we start to put the needle down then we start to play that piece and when you know i Back then, I didn't really know Beethoven music that much. I just feel this is so powerful. And also, and 
uh, strike me the most is you can hear so many different things um, going in the same time. In Chinese music, always very, very melodic, one line and uh, that kind of melody. But in the symphony, you can hear this melody, but also under the melody, there's some kind of rhythm and harmony. And so to structure this whole thing, it becomes so powerful. So that's what I remember the most. I really, you know, I already started to play the violin and then I just say, you know, this is the way I need to go on for my life. From there on, you know, I start to uh, continue to learn classical music and continue to learn about more about the Beethoven. And uh, in, I remember in 1972, and we supposed to go to a uh, field trip to, to, the, to the Forbidden City. That was really, Beijing had a big snow. And we walked from Dongzhimen, that which is the east, you know, it's really, it's the north part of the, the northeast part of Beijing to the Forbidden City in the door. And we just want to get in, they, they stopped us. They said that you cannot get in because we closed. And uh, then the special event. So then that, you know, we just have to go back. But be just before we turn back, there's someone came in from, from come out from the Forbidden City to say, no, 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 let's wait. Let's select the 10 kids go in the Forbidden City. And the, the reason that they told us I was selected, actually it's a Nixon visiting the Forbidden City in 1972, right? So we went in and, uh, and to, uh, we did never see anyone. So basically just want to decorate us as, as, as their people in Forbidden City. But anyway, that's what I remember the, uh, the Nixon visit China. And then the next year, you know, the Philadelphia Orchestra visit China. That's really a national news. It's a big news. And uh, we just, uh, I, I just suddenly you feel like there's some kind of freedom. That's like, a, you know, if a Beethoven can, music can be played, there must be more things we can looking forward to it. You speak so passionately, passionately about this time period. It must have been a really pivotal moment in your life. If I could just ask a, a quick follow-up question. Um, after the visit of the Philadelphia Orchestra, were you allowed to play Beethoven more freely in China? Uh, you start to have that, you know, and as a teenager during the Cultural Revolution, and just like a teenager today, and whatever the government doesn't want to do, you just want to try that. So, so we, you know, read some forbidden books and we always listen to uh, the uh, shortwave station from Soviet Union and the Voice of America. Whenever there's a music on, just, you know, just uh, like a Tchaikovsky music or even Yang Ji Dudo, you know, which is so it's exciting to, li to listen to this. And, but you, 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 you still can hear some West, what you call foreign music. But from after the Philadelphia Orchestra visit, definitely there are more, uh, more Western music start to play in on the radio. And they, they usually Chinese uh, uh, radio station always have quarter. Like uh, we play 90 minutes of Chinese music, 90% of music are Chinese music, 10% foreign music. So it's, a, it's yeah, it start to, 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 to get more. And, you know, until after the Cultural Revolution in uh, 1976. So that's um, when the National Symphony uh, played Beethoven Fifth Symphony, and over the uh, airwave, you know, the, read, the broadcasting, that's made many people feel, well, finally the turmoil is ending and we're open to the world. Yeah, so the end of the Cultural Revolution coincided with the opening of China to classical music as well. That's um, right. I'd like to remind everyone that if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to ask them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'd be happy uh, to collect those questions on your behalf. Um, so Jennifer, I, you're a first time filmmaker. Um, and as I was watching the documentary, I thought one of the things that was really effective was how you can cycle back and forth between past and present. I mean, you interweave historical footage with um, contemporary clips of the Philadelphia Orchestra in, in China. Um, and so I'm curious, 
about the challenges that you may have faced as a first time filmmaker um, in making this documentary or gaining access to, to the types of footage that you are able to use? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very challenging. <laughs> um, and part of the big biggest challenge was really getting my arms around the story. So, um, you know, we wanted to use 1973 as the starting point, but we really wanted to show through the Philadelphia Orchestra kind of this, this revival of classical music in China and how that's energizing the whole world of music. So we really, you know, we, we basically use the Philadelphia Orchestra as the main character, but in, in trying to capture what was happening in 1973, one of the challenges was uh, finding archival material. And, you know, as you know, the Cultural Revolution was a very controlled time and uh, the footage coming out of China then was mostly propaganda footage. So trying to find things that kind of conveyed what was going on was really difficult. Um, we, we did end up using uh, some European archival sources. Um, and there were some though golden nuggets that we found in our research. And one of them was the Nixon Library, which is right near UC Irvine. The Nixon Library has digitized um, all of the uh, film that was taken during the 1973 trip, all of the outtakes. Um, so these would have been staff people who were taking uh, just home movies. They were outtakes from some of the news organizations and they've made that available for free. So uh, for us to, to contextualize kind of what was happening in China during this period, we, we really were able to get a lot of footage from the uh, Nixon Library. The other thing I found at the library, which was like one of these eureka moments was uh, President Nixon uh, taped a lot of the conversations in the Oval Office and the library has made those recordings available to the public. So through a bit of like reverse reporting, I was able to figure out when it was that Richard Nixon called the conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Eugene Ormandy, to invite him to China. And so this was February of 1973. The tour was actually in, in September, but it was several months in advance. And Kissinger literally had just gotten off the plane from a trip to Beijing. And so I was able to find from the Nixon Library just this pristine audio of Richard Nixon inviting Eugene Ormandy to go to China. So that was like one of one of the golden nuggets that I found. But in terms of challenges, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, uh, Jin Dong, as you can hear, just tells wonderful stories about growing up in China and his experience with with music. But also, Jin Dong is a conductor. He's a musician, and he could explain for us kind of the difference between a, a symphonic piece and Chinese music. But as a filmmaker, the challenge was, well, how do we how do we convey that visually? How do you take Jin Dong's story about being a kid and secretly listening to Beethoven in his friend's house? How do you how do you convey that? And also, how do you explain visually the difference between the two styles of music? And the co-director of Beethoven in Beijing is Sharon Mullally, and she came up with the idea of hiring an animator. So we um, we found this wonderful animator, Jacob Rifkin, who's here in Philadelphia. And we literally found him by Googling animator and Chinese brushstroke style. And it turns out Jacob had studied as a Fulbright in Nanjing at the Art Institute and was very familiar with, with Chinese society as well as Chinese art forms. And so when we would talk to, to Jacob about trying to convey Jin Dong's story into a visual, I didn't have to tell him what a Chinese courtyard house looked like. He knew. And there's another wonderful piece of animation showing Tan Dun, the composer, traveling from his hometown in Hunan to Shanghai to audition for the Central Conservatory. So for that, uh, Jacob didn't, you know, I, again, I didn't have to tell him what the inside of a train would look like. He knew because he's, you know, been on those trains. This is before bullet trains. So anyway, that was another challenge. And, and the way we overcame it was through animation, which many documentary filmmakers are using now. But yeah, it was it, it was a, a tall climb, this, this movie. So, uh, you know, we, we again, we start with the past and we bring it to the present. So, so hopefully we've engaged the viewer. Did you have any um, issues 
taking footage in China or were people relatively open to, to allow a, a documentary film crew from the United yeah. States? Yeah, so we were very lucky because we were embedded with the Philadelphia Orchestra. So we were traveling with them when they were on tour. But you know, for any journalist or filmmaker working in, in China, there are added um, uh, challenges and issues. And you know, here in Philadelphia, if we want to go film in a park, you take your, your camera crew and you go to a park and you film people and you interview them, but that's not allowed in China. So when we did go to a park in Beijing just to take, um, you know, a vision, uh, shots of the Forbidden City with the concert hall, the big egg in the in the background, you know, we were stopped and, and we were kind of shooed out of the park because you're, you're just not allowed. Um, so, so there are issues like that, that any journalist, any filmmaker has to confront and you just have to kind of work within the rules. Uh, but again, we were very lucky to be able to travel with the orchestra and to film them. I went to China three times uh, with the orchestra and once with the Curtis Institute, which sent a group. And Jin Dong came with us uh, on several of those trips, one in 2016. And so that was our first trip. And what was really nice about that trip, Jin Dong, I think you'd agree, is we, we staged a kind of a reunion between some of the American musicians and their Chinese counterparts who they interacted with in 1973. There was this moment when the Philadelphia Orchestra went to the Central Philharmonics rehearsal and, and they did, uh, they performed uh, movements from Beethoven's Fifth. So a lot of those Chinese musicians really remember that moment and, and actually got pretty emotional when they were recounting it and meeting their American counterparts. So that was, that was a special, special moment, I think. Yeah, I think one of the things that the documentary does really well is just shows how music serves this interpersonal and cross-cultural function. It really helped to bring people together at this crucial moment in US-China relations. Um, and so Sheila, I mean, you've written extensively about how classical music has played a role in, in geopolitics. And, and as Jennifer was saying, you coined this phrase music diplom diplomacy. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe you can add a little bit more to this historical context. I mean, we're quickly approaching the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's um, visit to China in February of 1972. So what role would you say that music and the Philadelphia Orchestra's visit to China actually played in this diplomatic rapprochement? So what did music mean for geopolitics? politics at this time. I, I think music meant a lot and, and Beethoven in particular meant something too because actually you know before the Nixon visit Kissinger made several secret visits and several open visits to China in, in you know in the very early 70s and on one of these visits uh, Premier Zhou Enlai said to his staff he said hey Kissinger's German we should perform Beethoven for him. So then Zhou Enlai actually started secretly studying all the Beethoven symphonies. He had the conductor of the Central for Harmonic Li Luen come to the, to the Zhong Nanhai office by a back gate and teach him about the Beethoven symphonies. And then Mao Zedong's wife, who was leading the Cultural Revolution, Jiang Qing, she heard about it. So she started learning a little bit about Beethoven and Western music too. And then they gave, they actually allowed the, the Central Philharmonic to perform a Beethoven. I think they performed Beethoven for, for Kissinger. And Kissinger wrote about it in his memoirs. And he, you know, he said, they did us the favor of not making us listen to model operas, which was very nice of them. But I really wasn't sure what we were listening to when they played Beethoven or what order they were playing the notes. He wasn't very nice about it, in other words. But he recognized what Joe and Lyne meant. He said, what the music, what it means that playing Beethoven means they're seeking to open up to the outside world. And this is a signal. They're getting, it's not working anymore. The Cultural Revolution's dragging on. Even Mao Zedong said, we need to go abroad to study more now. So it was a signal and Kissinger, Joe and Lyne knew what he was delivering and Kissinger knew how to read it. So this was a signal that China wanted to open up. And that's why they followed up with the actual visit of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And that was 1973 and Mao didn't die for three more years. So it was still technically the Cultural Revolution. But then after 1976, it just opened wide up. And then music was one of the first things to follow. You know, Chinese musicians like Jin Dong, who hadn't been able to study openly and freely, went abroad and Western musicians went in. And it just started this whole wonderful exchange of musicians from both countries. And these Chinese musicians who came to the United States and Europe have vastly enriched our conservatories, our orchestras, our, you know, the classical music repertoire 
repertoire and vice versa. They were able to do it because of all the Westerners that were going there and helping them and supporting them. So it's just a great example of cultural exchange and diplomacy. And it's probably a model we're gonna to have to follow again when the pandemic's over because the relationship is so bad and there's been no cultural exchange for several years because of the pandemic. And I really hope people can look at this movie Jennifer made and look at this, the history of the Philadelphia Orchestra and use it as an example going forward. Yes, I completely agree about the importance of cultural exchange. And also programs like the Fulbright, which have temporarily been canceled. Hopefully they will also be reignited after the pandemic finally comes to a close. Um, but speaking of you know, the, the role of music in geopolitics, um, Jin Dong, you say in the documentary that you had been raised to think about the United States as the enemy. Uh, do you remember how you learned that the Philadelphia Orchestra would be visiting China and how did this reversal in China's attitude toward the United States make you feel? Yeah, see that's a, what when you when you look at the relations from political point of view always you see it's conflicts and obstacles but when you look at the cultural point of view actually there's a connections and I remember when I was young and this always American is the enemy so we uh, I you know when I was 10 years old as you learn that's what 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 do you learn and what do you remember you remember the Korean War what we are against uh, against uh, uh, American and also and what did they have been and teaching you to say we need to be strong we need to overcome and uh, the uh, America is our enemy but at the same time it's a it's a jilohu, it's a paper tiger yeah so we definitely can overcome so i remember vaguely remember when we had the first uh, the nuclear bomb how this whole nation's been so excited and it's, it's, i think excited more is about you know we can do this too so so it's a, that kind of a, 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 a things in my mind that you know, talk about america always always it's, it's a dark side but suddenly after the Cultural Revolution, everything opened. You know, when the Philadelphia Orchestra visited China, you just feel, wow, this orchestra is just so wonderful. And after that, there's, you know, the Boston Symphony Orchestra came with uh, C.C. Ozawa conducting, and then the Vienna Philharmonic, London Symphony, and uh, Berlin Philharmonic. You know, and I become older teenager and become first year in college. I experience all those and I don't want to miss any single rehearsal and concerts. And you, you know, I do have to say, if there's now Philadelphia uh, Orchestra visit China, now those, those orchestras and music exchange, and there's not me, you know? So basically I'm the product of this, this cultural exchange. And and on the other you know on uh, on the other side as well I think um, you know cultural make us different and unique but it's also a cultural can connect people so that's what I think is it's a, even today it's a very very important we continue to do that and uh, I I I am a product of this Western music came you know I uh, when I look at it. Uh, C.Z. Ozawa conducting. When I look at the Karyon conducting, you know, I just uh, transfixed. And then, then I decided I want to be conductor. And I, if I want to be conductor, I want to go to the West to study. So that's how I came to America to enter the New England Conservatory. And uh, so then, you know, uh, in 1985, and I didn't speak any English, but I just came and then read the history, you know, and then, but after a while, and when I start my career in America to conduct American orchestras, if I go to Ch uh, Charleston, go to Little Rock, Arkansas, or go to some of those uh, really deep American uh, uh, city to conduct American orchestras, and when I introduce music that, or answer to, uh, the audience question, they always ask me to say, you're Chinese, why you become Western musician? How about your Chinese music? So they don't really know anything about Chinese music. And then that, that make me to realize, you know, how, uh, my, it, how unique my position is. Uh, I can just to, to, to help with this, this cultural extent to, to make people to understand more. So especially in the, in the past decades, I think, you know, I, I really like whenever I do concerts in China, I always uh, want to do American program. It's, a, it's a, like a, even 
20 years ago when I first time met uh, Sheila in Shanghai because I was conducting Shanghai Symphony and uh, to do American symphonic music program that including Bernstein, Copeland, and or John Cogliano, or so those just just a really first time to have a serious American music, uh, symphonic music to be introduced to Chinese orchestra. And Sheila was interested to interview me for Wall Street Journal story. So that's how we met. And after that, I think from now on, and each time I go back, I do some American music. And same time in the past decades, I do lots of Chinese contemporary music and symphonic music in America. And I, you can, people like both. You know, people like to learn something new. And especially in 21st century, already 20 something years past. And for classical music world, doesn't matter a Chinese classical musicians or Western classical musicians, we're all looking for the future of classical music. We have been playing dead people's music for so long. And what is the music of our time? And the music, the world becomes so combined and related. And I think the next generation of music, the music of our time should be including more cultural. So that's what I feel. And you know, and in terms of enemy or friends, that's I think is a political term. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A box. I see some people were raising their hands, but it's best if you type your question into the the Q and A box. Um, Jin Dong, your note about the future of classical music um, actually kind of tied into. One of my my next questions that I was thinking about as I was watching the film, I mean, the documentary ends on this note that classical music belongs to the world, that it's not something that is intrinsic to the West. It's not something that is really just a product of Western culture, but it belongs to the world. It is a global phenomenon. So what do you think, and this is just a question for all three of you, so feel free to answer it as, as you see fit, but what do you think is the future of classical music in China, or the future of Chinese composers writing orchestral music? I, you know, for symphonic music or symphony orchestra, this art, uh, format, it's become international. It's a start with in Europe, but then came to America or came to China uh, and, and the rest of the world. It's become very powerful tool for expressing, uh, you know, musicians' uh, to the feelings and to to show people what it, uh, the the individually can create. So that because that become a tool, so everyone can use it. Of course, for example. Uh, China, it, they call now, it's a classical music powerhouse. They produce so many uh, pianists like Long Long, you know, uh, Wang Yujia, and you know, they also provide so many other uh, classical music musicians in today's world. You can say any symphony orchestra, any opera house, any conservatory in the West, and you can find Chinese, decent, great Chinese musicians. So the Western music has been developed that in depth in China. But at the same time, you think people, Chinese people get those two, of course they want to create their own music. So that definitely is another kind of wave and it's coming, forthcoming. So that's what I think And in, in the future, classical music will be combined with more uh, cultural elements and from different cultures. You know, when I came to the to, to America in 1980s, and nobody understand what is arhu, what is pipa, what are those instruments? They don't really know Chinese music at all. But now, you know, in the past couple of decades, I const constantly conducting pipa concerto with Western orchestra and guzheng concerto with orchestra, arhu with orchestra. So that's it's kind of another way. The music itself is progressing. If you talk about, like, uh, you go back to Mozart time, you know, Mozart time, Mozart, most of Mozart symphonies, and um, for the wind instrument, they are only a pair of oboe and pair of um, bassoon. So there's, is, and then once Mozart went to um, Paris, he found that Paris orchestra actually start to use clarinet in the orchestra. So then he came back and add a clarinet in his later symphonies. 
and then then Beethoven at trombone in the orchestra, and then Mahler, you know, that add more instruments, Stravinsky, and more instruments, the orchestra become grown and become bigger, become a, a so. A, a, a so much different color uh, uh, emerged. I think for the 21st century, you just think about the same way. There are more music elements from all different cultures around the world will join the traditional classical music format to produce something kind of like our life today. It's kind of more synthetic version of classical music, bringing together multiple cultures. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Actually, first, a, a comment from an audience member named Zhu Shan, who says that um, when they were a second grader in Beijing, uh, that was when Nixon visited China. Uh, and they remember hearing about the Philadelphia Orchestra performing in Beijing, which is a really exciting time. So this truly was a, a watershed moment in a lot of people's uh, memories and experiences. Uh, but Zhu Shan then goes, goes on to ask a question. Um, and their question is, what is the status of classical music in the United States and how is the Philadelphia Orchestra's popularity in China and its legacy from numerous performances in China impacting US and Chinese classical music scenes and cultural exchanges? So have there been a lot of ongoing musical collaborations between China and the United States um, in the present day? Yeah, so um, maybe I could answer that. Um, the Philadelphia Orchestra has, has gone to China a total of 12 times. And I think that's more than any American orchestra. So clearly they recognize that China is a, you know, a very important market uh, for their orchestra. Um, but it's not only the Philadelphia Orchestra. If you look at any top tier orchestra in the world, they now include Beijing and Shanghai on their tour schedules on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, as, as we try to convey in the film, there, there is much more collaboration uh, between American and, and Chinese orchestras. And the analogy I, I use often is that back in 73, the cultural bridge was basically going one way when it came to classical music with orchestras from the US or Europe or Japan going to China to perform. But now it's very much a two-way bridge. And uh, you know, a good example of that is the Philadelphia Orchestra, which um, in 2019 had a, a concert in Philadelphia, a side-by-side -side concert with the Shanghai Philharmonic. And the music they were performing was the work of a, a young uh, Chinese composer by the name of Peng Peng. And so to me, that kind of, it was a great way to end the film because it shows kind of how things are evolving and how very much now there is this kind of cultural collaboration going on. Can I add something? Go for it. Yeah, I just think uh, it's interesting to think about the impact of the pandemic because the impact of the pandemic on American orchestras has been really, really terrible. You know, many of the orchestras, their budgets are down by 25%. You know, they couldn't perform for more than a year, many of them. And the re I think the recovery period's gonna be a long one. But in China, the situation's, you know, they were only they were shut down hardly at all and we don't you know the pandemic's not over we don't know what's going to happen yet but this is you know the orchestra has been performing in china for the most part it's been a great opportunity for chinese soloists because chinese orchestras before always like to invite conductors from abroad and soloists from abroad but no one can travel or they can't travel much so a lot of chinese soloists have a lot more opportunity to perform in china for chinese audiences so i think probably what you're seeing is the classical music world in china has gained strength over the course of the pandemic or at least not weakened whereas our orchestras have suffered tremendously. So in a couple of years, when the pandemic finally ends, is we're gonna be in a sort of analogous situation where, where, but it's our orchestras who are gonna need help. And the China opportunity, if we can have these exchanges again, it will be terrific. Like the Philadelphia Orchestra, when it was having financial difficulties, went and did a China residency for a long time. You know, it's, China's been very helpful to Philadelphia, just as Philadelphia was helpful to China. And I think that's something we're gonna to have to hope for going forward. Um, it will help the orchestras directly and it will help the diplomatic relations as we spoke of before. I agree with Sila, and uh, you know, um, even now, when um, before the pandemic, every time when I go back to China, I feel the contemporary music world in China is really very vibrating. It's just so many things going on, and I think even during the pandemic, you know, I heard from my friends, and I look at what the festival producing is a majority of those works they're doing today is a new music. And you know, there's a 
opera based on and using an artificial intelligence or there's some uh, you know there's so many new things happening in china i think it, 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 if we learn to eat from each other it can definitely benefit classical music in america and also i think an american has this tradition the classical music is really not supported by the government it's supported by the individual so it's a it's a this this kind of a Thing made many arts organizations and especially symphony orchestras very unstable. And as, as you know, I think every couple of years there's orchestra just fall because they don't have enough support. And on the other hand, in China, I think in every level, the, the, the leaders not necessarily they want to make a political statement, but they want to stay, they want to uh, make people to think they're cultural people. So they support arts, they, they, they put it, um, uh, resources on the development of music. So those are, um, we, that's why, you know, at Bard College, we created the US China Music Institute is trying to bridge the two sides and try to make um, musicians to understand each other. Musicians can really uh, exchange ideas, exchange works, and so we can, uh, you know, both uh, benefits from them. Yeah, Sheila and Jin Dong's points about how in China, um, music is, is really flourishing, whereas in the United States, it's kind of underfunded at the moment, ties into uh, another question that one of our audience members has asked. Um, and he's um, curious about how the documentary contrasted um, music education in China, which is very, very prevalent, with the declining importance of music edu education in the United States. And he's curious about why you think this might be the case. Why has China continued to privilege music education when it, there's such a declining importance on music education in the U.S. I, I think in the U.S. It's, it's a matter of cost. And so many public school systems in particular are under pressure to cut costs. And so, um, you know, in the film, we use the example of the Phila Philadelphia situation. And there was one whole scene that had to be cut just because we needed to tighten the, the film. But it was 10 years ago and the Philadelphia school district was going to eliminate the budget for music education. Now we're one of the largest cities in the country and the music program in the Philadelphia public schools is, is very celebrated. I mean, they, they produce you know, world-class musicians. So there was such backlash in the community. There was actually a protest concert where uh, students and teachers of music kind of took over the lobby of the uh, district headquarters and, and put on a protest um, concert. And the, the director of the school district ultimately restored the budget, but it just goes to show you how vulnerable it is within schools, uh, the funding of music education. And in China, it's, it's not so much the case. Now, I think it was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jilin Jindong, but I think it was Zhang Zimin who really made the first push for music education in schools. And, uh, you know, the Chinese firmly believe that to be an educated person, you need to understand music. Um, so I think that's kind of the, 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 the simple explanation. Um, you know, it's not that music isn't valued by Americans, it is, but the cost of music education is really under pressure. And, and the thing is though, you know, we're talking about classical music. So other forms of music in the United States are thriving. Like when you think about modern music, jazz, I mean, how many high schools have jazz band competitions and marching bands? So there is music, but it's, it's the, the classical tradition that's I think most under pressure. Yeah, I, I also, I think that there's something also related to how do you, value music. I, I feel like if uh, um, American so, uh, our society and um, just trade music, classical music, like we trade sports, you know, that, that will be, that will be definitely will make a big uh, impression on young people, you know? So I think uh, we should think about that. And on the, on the other hand, in China, the tradition, the cultural uh, music, and art is very important for kids to grow up. 
And so that's why you see, it doesn't matter in American Chinese family or Asian family in general, or families in China, they always encourage their kids to learn classical music because they believe the classical music not only help you to develop artistic vision, but also help you set up your discipline and help you to become better person. So that I think the to how to value music and that we just need to learn, also need to learn from each other. Jindong, maybe if we could feature you on a box of Wheaties, that might change people's <laughs> opinions. So I think we have um, one uh, time for maybe one more question. Um, uh, and this is again from uh, Jushan, who is a fellow documentary filmmaker. Um, and they wanted to ask um, Jennifer specifically about her creative choices. Um, so how did you decide which footage to use? How did you decide how much to weigh the personal versus the historical, the present versus the past? Um, how did you decide what to include and what to cut? Yeah, uh, Jushen has a very interesting documentary that she's working on about her own personal journey. Um, but for me, I, I think, and for Sharon, the co-director, we, we had a guiding some guiding principles when we were trying to tell this very big story. And that was, um, you know, I, I didn't want the, the story to be just from the American perspective. I very much wanted it to be grounded in kind of a, a Chinese perspective. And then the other challenge was finding individuals who could kind of propel our story, who could take it from the past to the present. So in, in honing our narrative, we, we then focused on three characters in particular. Tan Dun, the composer, who entered the uh, Central Conservatory in 1978 and kind of represents that first generation of musicians after the Cultural Revolution. And then Lang Lang, who grew up in the 1980s, 1990s, and represents kind of that second generation who really took advantage of everything uh, and then the third character in our story is the composer Peng Peng, and he really represents the current young generation. I think Peng Peng is 30 years old and has composed 10 symphonies or more. So he represents someone who was trained at Juilliard, but is now the resident composer at the Shanghai Phil and kind of represents that new generation. So I think, you know, as a filmmaker, it was very important to ground the story in characters, not just to have talking heads and archival footage, and then to identify who those, those characters were going to be, and then to let them kind of take the viewer from the past to the present. Um, Sheila or Jindong, I don't know if you have anything, any final thoughts that you wanted to add before we wrap up? If not, I think, um, we are probably just about out of time. And so again, I would really love to thank our wonderful panelists, Jennifer Lin, Jin Dong Tsai, and Sheila Melvin for joining us today. Um, again, if you haven't yet watched the documentary, you can still do so through January 26th. We will drop the link for how to do that in the chat. It's completely free, so you might as well take advantage of it. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Happy Lunar New Year, and hopefully we will see you at our next webinar. So take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.